Hello and welcome back to the Walking Dead Retrospective, where today we'll be beginning our way through the quite messy Season 10 and some of the most brutal comic book volumes in the entire Whisperer arc. With Season 10 even more so than 9, in addition to the massive character differences between the adaptation and the books, there are also some very major remixes in the order of events. So as is trend at this point, we will be jumping around between the two versions for often prolonged periods of time just to make comparisons more one-to-one. -one. All that said, buckle up and let us dive right into the penultimate season. As per usual, a new season means a look at the wider state of the franchise going into the heart of the Whisperer story. With season 10, we are already deep into 2019 and the year that shall not be named. So even for those of you who might have joined the series sometime later on, these are likely not distant memories. But for those of you following the series since the early days, I think I'm not alone in saying that the overall buzz surrounding the show was in a very, very odd place. After the ups and downs of the Negan saga, the sentiment around the entire franchise was not in a great place. So there, it was unsurprising that engagement was just also down as well. With seasons 9 and 10, however, I feel like most fans were quite shocked just how well the introduction to the Whispers went despite Rick's and Maggie's exits. And that's not even mentioning the already compounding absence of Carl and to a lesser extent Sophia, both of whom would have a significant role in this entire arc. But at the same time, I would be lying if I said I was as excited for season 10 as every other preceding season. Which is why I can only really describe it as odd. Because like I said, I was certainly not disappointed by Season 9. I sort of found myself in this odd place where The Walking Dead was seemingly back to normal, but for whatever reason, I wasn't that excited for it. Hello, Editing Kuroto jumping in. I can't believe I forgot to mention it, but the summer of 2019 is also when the comic just abruptly came to a close. So obviously, there was also quite a bit of sadness stemming from that and likely covered my perceptions of everything to do with The Walking Dead. That said, back to past Kuroto. And unfortunately, once Christmas for Walking Dead fans rolled around, that of course being Comic-Con, I feel like that odd sense of hype, but not really hype, was only strengthened in my case. I think judging by the sheer amount of time I've spent talking about trailers and whatnot in the series, you'll know that many of them do hold a very special place in my heart. And as I mentioned with the Season 9 and 8 ones, and them already having this odd sense of modernism that I wasn't really a huge fan of in the context of The Walking Dead, Season 10 is that, but turned up to 11. Somehow. Compared to the previous trailers that were always dark and gritty, this one just feels sort of generic to me. I guess I would say that it feels just personality-less and just like your typical Hollywood action trailer, with it even doing the, in my opinion, extremely overdone thing of playing this epic music, suddenly cutting to complete silence for a comedic joke, and then jumping right back into the music. You wanna go back, don't you? Yeah, I could go all night. When you juxtapose this trailer to the older trailers that, for example, interspersed Beth singing in this extremely bleak tone that happened within the episode, that sense of just modernism and sort of this upbeat action just feels jarring. Especially considering that we are dealing with the Whispers, one of the most messed up groups in the entire Walking Dead universe. I know we're all exhausted, but we gotta push just a little bit more some food, medicine. I'm not a killer, and I know that. All we do is run. You're dangerous. And before, not toe to toe. I think the first half of this trailer is generally much more horror-centric, which I do very much enjoy, and there are certainly some very cool visuals in this one as well. But for me, it is the overall tone that really misses the mark. Admittedly, this might be a case of old man Kuroto's mystery shack who fell off screaming at a cloud again, but it's my video and I'm allowed to complain, okay? And in a similar vein, the posters of the season were also a tad hit and miss for me. We got some, like Daryl walking among the walkers, which was straight up old school walking dead goodness and you won't catch me complaining even for a second, but at the same time, and I definitely know this is me complaining about things that literally no one cares about, I think some of their rebranding toward minimalistic designs hurt the established vibe of the walking dead, sort of like I already mentioned with the intro of the series changing. Like, for example, take the Season 10 logo. Yeah, the whole Roman numeral with Michonne's katana is cool, but you've gotta admit, just having TWD in this wobbly quartile thing where it goes up and down does seem just a little bit odd. 
And before we get into the season itself, let us also address the usual question of how much material does the season adapt? Well, here, I think it is extremely important to note that, at this point, the storylines are so drastically different that these numbers can be very, very deceptive, which we'll of course get to plenty more soon. Purely numbers-wise, the crazy thing here is that if you take away the additional 6 episodes, Season 10 would have adapted a whopping 29 issues, making that roughly 1.8 per episode, which would make it even faster than the breakneck pace of Season 3. Accounting for the extension though, it puts it at a more modest but still very fast 1.3 issues per episode. Though, like I said, because the season simply removes a lot of the character-centric stories from the book and replaces them with completely new ones, it may seem like the bigger picture is moving along quite fast, while that might not exactly be the case. On top of that, the Whisper War in the comics is quite notorious for being somewhat rushed, which further contributes to it technically adapting a lot of material. Though not to get stuck in the technicalities, we will be talking plenty about this with practical examples. And with that, let us finally dive into the story, where we have a few things to tackle in the books first. As is often the case when comparing the two, the TV show usually has some sort of time skip between season finales and premieres. Whereas the book is, for the most part at least, always told continuously with no major time jumps. And so, right after Rick addresses the communities about what happened with the border, we see Eugene meet him back at their house to give his take on the situation, which largely shapes this little upcoming mini-arc. Just like with them meeting Negan and the Saviors, Eugene is absolutely fuming and once again comes to Rick personally to tell him that they need to strike back at the Whispers. Only unlike the Saviors, where his big revelation was producing ammunition, here he has identified an even greater level of influence none other than Lydia herself. For me, this is one of those really interesting things about the comic Eugene that we don't really see in the adaptation. In the book, he is this interesting mix of extremely rational and calculated, but also extremely emotional. Because in this case, he has indeed identified Alpha's biggest weakness in just a few moments. Though rationally, he is also fully aware that without a plan, they are toast. Something we'd see on full display in just a few issues. He might be the one spearheading and fanning the flames of this upcoming resistance. But because underneath all of that burning hatred, he is still our smarty pants Eugene, he'd also soon be the one trying to put out said flames before it gets out of control. And similarly, because in the TV version we have a lot more focal characters, all of whom both explicitly and implicitly fulfill the leadership roles through their council method, we also never get to see these more tight-knit, centralized scenes of decision-making. I would say that the way the show tackles all of this is in certain ways more realistic, as we do have characters just making decisions not because it's the best for the group, but because they selfishly just want it themselves, with Carol and her solo mission being the most prominent example. But at the same time, I think it also results in what, kind of paradoxically, feels like lower stakes. Usually, with many independent decisions being made at the same exact time, you would expect there to be a constant sense of uneasiness because you just can't predict what will happen next. But personally, I always felt a greater pressure of danger following only Rick, who somehow had to traverse this ever-mounting pressure from all sides. While we don't have any characters suddenly springing into action wanting to go after Alpha here and now, the mere threat of that potentially happening always just felt a lot more tense to me. Then again, it's also important to note that I had read the book first, so maybe just knowing the major story beats sort of removed that uneasiness for me. Especially because at this point, I felt that Daryl, Michonne, and Carol were just absolutely untouchable. Whereas in the comic, well, we'll get to that. Though continuing right on from the Eugene drama, we see Rick talking to Andrea about how Lydia isn't safe here, and also noting that it also means Carl is not safe. Andrea, being the giga chat that she is, tells Rick that she would personally sneak both of them out of Alexandria and just somewhere else. Which is exactly what we see as the trio quietly disappears in the night. And soon after they vanish, we see a restless Rick. Only for us to cut to the outside of his house where Michonne appears to be sneaking in. Though as soon as she opens the doors, Rick is right there to hold her up. First calling her Rusty and then saying that he is disappointed in her. And yes, I know for you TV onlys, this is probably about as bizarre of a scene as you can possibly imagine. But you know, get used to it, that is season 10 and 11. 
Anyway, putting Rick's worries to rest, she tells him that she isn't here for revenge or anything like that. But rather because she wanted to do exactly what Andrea is doing right now. She knew Lydia had to be taken away from here before something bad happens. And it's here where we learn of just how far Eugene's supposed uprising has already gotten. With her warning Rick that tomorrow is going to be a very, very ugly day for him. And keep this entire Eugene thing in mind as it will be super important in a minute when we get to the show. Though before we do, we also get to see a very, very raw conversation between Rick and Michonne. They begin by just talking about how each of them are doing, Michonne's tendency to push people away, etc, etc. Though as if this 3am talk wasn't already brutal enough, Rick then mentions that, in many ways, he was the same with Lori. He says that they obviously loved each other, but while he was still an officer, he saw things that he kept from her. Things that changed him. And no matter how close they were, he could never share those things. And again, Kirkman using the good old implied horror here. Rick never actually says what he saw. He literally just says, there were things that changed me and things that were sort of brutal. But yes, he then says that with Andrea, it is so different. Saying they've lived through everything together and that the bond between them is stronger than it ever was with Lori. And maybe as some of you are thinking right now, Michonne then also asks, but why are you telling me all of this? To which Rick responds by saying, Horrible things happen, he lost his wife and his daughter. That pain never goes away, but no matter what, he keeps pushing on and here he's standing, happy that he has Andrea. Saying that he's ashamed of even saying it, but that there is not a single thing he can do about it. Finishing by saying, just like with you. And this single conversation just so perfectly encapsulates Rick post time skip. On the face of it, he seems like a friendly old man bantering with you about running past him in the day or something like that. But underneath all of that, everything he has lived through in the apocalypse never went away. And with what we're getting into now, more and more that will begin to bleed through. And also, notice Rick's language here, though more on this in a second. And oh Kirkman, you evil man. Because not only is this conversation excellent in the present day, but oh, does it hit so, so much different in retrospect. And is the absolute shining example of what we missed out on in the adaptation. Just real quick, for you TV onlys, you know how he just talked about him being closer to Andrea than he ever was with Lori, and that their bond has helped him fight on and get Carl through all of this? Yeah, well, this is Kirkman, so in like three weeks in universe, Andrea dies. And so this entire little conversation becomes the perfect looming omen over everything that comes next. Because yes, with every single big decision thus far, we have always had those little bedtime conversations between Rick and Andrea. So with Rick now vocalizing just how much she means to him, what happens when all of that is ripped away? Plenty more on this very soon. And to quickly wrap up the Andrea side of the story, she just sneaks them over to the hilltop, both taking advantage of everyone still being in Alexandria after the fair concluded, and also leveraging her status to just tell everyone that they never saw them. And a smaller thing to note here that, again, I think might just come down to a real person playing out these scenes, but with Lydia in the book, there are some lines of dialogue here where I didn't think she is angry with the community for hating her, or rebelling against them, or anything like that. Rather, I always read it as a case of her being so traumatized by the Whisperer's way of life that she straight up doesn't grasp normal societal norms anymore. With her literally just saying, You told me your people take care of each other. Why do they suddenly want to hurt me? Not sure if it's just my own personal read on the character, but in the book, Lydia just seemed to be a lot less emotionally charged and more so just confused if that makes sense. In the show, she would make a proactive decision to change everyone's minds. Whereas in the book, largely because Carl is there, she's just constantly asking him, what is this? How does this work? What's going on? Finally jumping on over to the adaptation, and some of you TV onlys might have also picked up on a difference in tone, but in case you haven't, well, I think literally the opening shots of season 10 illustrate it very, very well. Keep in mind that the winter has passed since the season 9 finale, aka literal months have passed since the border happened. But, uh, we never saw any of it. We never saw those incredibly raw emotions running high like we saw with Eugene in the book. We got to see like a tiny bit of that in the storm, but nowhere near the level of the comic book. 
And if that is Oddity 1, then Oddity 2 is this whole militia that is already formed here and how from this point on, we'd always hear the survivors saying, check their hands, as if they'd be attacked at any moment. With the whole, the whispers of return angle being played up an absolute ton. To me, it always had this weird sense that Season 10 opens with us basically being at war already. And for some reason, we never see the immediate fallout of the border and all of the turmoil against Lydia specifically was, for some reason, lagging by three months. In the comic, while we obviously have all the patrol guards in their training, explicit combat training happens under much different circumstances which we'll get to later on. Though the TV version honestly seemed to just be so afraid of the dragged out March to War storyline that this time around, they already dropped us into a pseudo conflict. Because like, technically, we are not at war yet, we would still see the meet up and everything like that. But like, based on how they treat each other and again, the whole check their hands thing, it's as if we were already at war. And don't get me wrong, it makes total sense to be cautious and everything like that. Them training is 100% the right call, but looking at it in the context of the comic where, again, we put so, so much emphasis on literally the preceding day of the border, it just seems odd that we never got to see the fleshed out version of what we saw in the storm. And no, this isn't just me wishing we got to see more snow. Okay, it is. But I also think there should have just been a lot more of the immediate revolting instead of, again, one that is delayed by months for seemingly no good reason. So it's not really anything in the story that I have a problem with, but rather the fashion it is told. To me, it makes much more sense that people would hate Lydia because their emotions are running high and they would try to come after her literally days after the fair. And then we would develop a military to sort of fight back against this fear brewing within our community. Whereas in the show, it sort of happens in reverse order. The military is already established and it's only then that the Lydia drama actually peaks. Like, the fact that she is hiding herself in a prison cell months after what happened just seems so, so odd. But whatever the case, another thing to note here is that the show adds quite a bit of lore about the Whispers. Gamma is entirely added, for example. But some of the more day-to-day -day things on the Whispers side are also shown to us, whereas in the comic, much like we saw with Negan, many of their actions are completely unknown to us. That said, we do have a scene of us actually seeing Alpha which is a sequence that the adaptation put earlier in Season 9. We see Alpha crying by herself in the woods, obviously in relation to Lydia. Though another whisper comes up to her, basically says that he understands what she's feeling and that her secret is safe with him. But also adding that she should be careful of others seeing this supposed weakness of her. So all things considered, this guy looks to be one of the good ones. But yeah, Alpha kills him like literally immediately, so F's in the chat. A massive development in the comic is everything on the Savior's side, which yes, in case you've forgotten, the Sanctuary is still perfectly fine in the comic and the Saviors are part of the Joint Trade Network. Though like we talked about last time, Dwight already spoke to Rick about wanting to step down from his leadership position. And so, that's exactly what we see here. Though before I say anything else, do note that, for whatever reason, certain prints of issue 148 and 149 use the wrong names when Dwight talks about Sherry. Like, he randomly calls her Debbie and a few other wacky names, so I guess that's pretty fun, but just something to be aware of. That aside though, we see that Laura, an ex-savior, is quite worried about what might happen if Dwight just up and leaves the sanctuary. Especially now that we have found ourselves in the thick of yet another conflict, with her ultimately just saying that, right now, you just can't quit. And as their conversation continues, Laura kinda sorta gaslights Dwight, saying that Sherry threw him to the curb as soon as Negan offered them safety. And while Dwight doesn't really respond to this provocation, saying that it still doesn't change how he feels, Laura suddenly says, there are people who appreciate you for who you are, going in to kiss him. Though yet again, Dwight just brushes her off saying, I am still leaving. And so we see him pack up his stuff along with Lucille and head out. Though not before he is once again called by Laura, who basically too says, you know what, <coughs> this place, let's bounce. Meanwhile at Alexandria, Rick's long night of deliberation has passed and in the morning he calls for a community meeting, where he, along with Maggie, Jesus, Michonne and the others, addresses Alexandria. And here, we kinda sorta have the whole council vibe of the show, but they are there to just more so convey that they stand behind Rick rather than they have voted on some sort of decision or anything super explicit like that. Ultimately, it is still Rick calling the shots. 
though he addresses the community, saying that their first course of action is to establish a significant patrol along Alpha's border that'll attempt to gather any and all information as to what the Whispers are up to. Continuing by saying, they would also have small squads lead covert expeditions into Alpha's lands to grasp their total numbers. And again, just like I mentioned before, we do see this entire covert intel gathering, scooting around Alpha's border, etc, etc in the show as well. Only, it happens literal months after the border was first established, which to me, just again, seems very, very odd. But anyway, despite Rick laying out this course of action, many people here immediately just yell that Rick is not doing enough. And while Rick does try to explain that they can just march into their lands with no plan, with Eugene too now trying to de-escalate the situation, things very, very quickly get out of control and a full-blown brawl breaks out. And while many of our heavy hitters, including Jesus, are there, it still spirals out of control. Which is when we see the return of none other than... Shut up. Rick shoots off his gun, saying that if anyone makes a move, he will put them into the ground, immediately stopping the riots dead in its tracks. And another thing to note that I haven't really mentioned much because YouTube, ever since the end of All Out War, you will likely notice that Rick often uses a lot of F-boys in his speech as well. A trait that no doubt originates from Negan's ever-colorful language. And that is also exactly what we see here though he then tells everyone to go home before someone gets seriously hurt, saying that what happened here cannot happen again. They are all scared, but they cannot begin to turn on each other. Preserving what they have now is the most important step in fighting back against the Whispers. And this is one of those things that I think the show absolutely nailed. We'll get to this later on, but it was clear in the show that everything with the Whispers is largely a battle of attrition, and a full-blown battle would only follow once the survivors have been whittled down. Jumping back on over to the adaptation, we see Carol arrive back from her boat adventures a la Michonne in the comic. In many ways, we see the same sort of dynamic with Ezekiel and her as we do, or I guess did, in the book. Though in the show, he is in a much, much darker place currently. In the book, before he was yoinked by Alpha, while he did struggle with Michonne just suddenly leaving etc etc, the kingdom was still standing and the communities were thriving, so there weren't really any external pressures. In the show on the other hand, he hosts the first ever fair, which goes horribly wrong with him losing Henry on the same exact night. Not only that, the kingdom itself falls, and then Carol too just suddenly up and leaves. So things aren't going too well for our ever smiling king. Also, the whole whimsical friendship between Daryl and Carol is lifted right out of the book, with them two doing the whole... Best friend? What are you, Sam? Whatever. Should we have matching bracelets now? Oh my god, forget it. I got an idea. Why don't we eat and not talk? But generally speaking, we just catch up on where they're at, and yes, these scenes are very, very wholesome. The Daryl Carol dynamic is definitely a highlight for me in this upcoming conflict, so we'll be talking plenty more about that very soon. Though it is also a very good showcase of just how different the two versions are at this point. Carol will play an absolutely pivotal role here, with Henry's death looming over all of that. While in the comic, we don't have these singular character rivalries like we see with Carol and Alpha. But yeah, much, much more on that later in the season. Another thing that is added for the show is the satellite crashing down in the premiere, which, yeah. I'll be honest with you, this is a season premiere that I had honestly just completely erased from my mind because the satellite crashing down in near perfect condition straight up gave me the 100 vibes of realism and I don't want to think about the 100 ever again. And yes, as per usual, we are talking about The Walking Dead. Talking about realism is silly, right? I mean, we literally have zombies. But it's not that it's not realistic, but that it's so unrealistic that it breaks the suspension of disbelief that is already quite strong in a setting like The Walking Dead. Like, zombies are not realistic, but they fit the world of The Walking Dead. A satellite crashing down in perfect condition is not realistic as well, but it is also dumb. There's a long debate to be had around this whole balance between in-universe laws and realism, especially when it comes to more fantasy-centric stories, but the satellite seriously made me laugh out loud when I first saw it. And because I was curious, I obviously looked deeper into it. And lucky for me, Tarek Malik, I guess I'm sorry if I butchered the name, but they were also curious and talked to Jonathan McDowell, an astrophysicist working at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in Cambridge. And yeah, while he says that, the visuals of it are 
relatively accurate, actually retrieving anything that is intact from it is, and I quote, not plausible. In interviews, Angela Kang explained that they thought this angle of paranoia and constantly being watched was one they wanted to play up. So a satellite, something that is literally designed to track and see movements, crashing down right next to them was just another symbolic way to convey said paranoia. And while I can definitely see that, it's just yet another case of me thinking that it doesn't feel like The Walking Dead, if that makes any sense. To me, most of The Walking Dead story was always a matter of actions and consequences of said actions. While this just feels so detached from everything else that it just feels, well, just that, detached. It's just a big action piece for the sake of having a big action piece in the premiere, which just again seems very, very odd to me. But my old man screams at cloud energy aside, I guess it is a pretty cool way of both driving the Whisper conflict and giving Eugene a way to start properly surfing the radio waves for a certain someone. So, as a plot device, I guess it's pretty neat. Another totally new addition for the show is the flashback we get of Alpha meeting Beta, which continues the trend of the show expanding more on the villain side of the story. Though like I've mentioned before in Season 9, this episode does make things a tad confusing with Alpha's backstory that is later told in Tales of the Walking Dead. Let me really quickly just catch you up on all the Alpha lore. She killed Lydia's father and shaved her head at the very very start of the apocalypse, still going by the name D. But later, we see her with long hair once again in Tales of the Walking Dead, where we learn that she is not the one who created the Whispers, and that it was rather Hera. In the same Tales episode, we also hear that she has been with them for at least one year. So, it should have been long enough for her to regrow her long hair from absolutely nothing, and to spend a whole year with them. But then in the Season 10 episode, we see that she has once again shaved her head when she meets Beta some seven-ish years into the apocalypse. So the timeline of all of these events has to be quite tight, all things considered. But to lay out my current understanding of the events, this is it. She first started butting heads with Hera over leadership. She then left these so-called first whispers that are not created by her. Later, she met Beta, with whom she already knew how to produce the Whisperer masks in the first place. And then, she returned to challenge Hera and become Alpha herself. Generally, I think that's what makes the most sense, and then we'd sort of have the whole death of Dee in the apocalypse starting, where she sort of becomes the Walking Dead just like the main group. And then, she is reborn as Alpha, with her taking the helm. But then again, literally the official AMC blog also says that Beta's mask is the first ever Whisper mask to be created, which just straight up is not true, as Alpha is not the first Whisperer, nor the first one to create masks. I suppose there's an argument to be made that all of this is speaking about Alpha's Whispers and not the Whispers as a concept. But whatever the case, the Tales episode can make the timeline seem just a little odd when you really try to piece everything together. Though again, it is sort of a side story and definitely not something you need to watch if that makes sense. And like I've mentioned already, absolutely all of this is 100% TV exclusive. The comic never gives us these in-depth explorations of how they came to power, how they came up with the Whisper strategy to begin with, why Beta is so loyal to Alpha, etc. All of those are just mysteries that are left for us to think about and that's about it. And another thing that is entirely TV exclusive is the whole battle of attrition that we begin to see here. With the hilltop suddenly experiencing walker attacks, people in Alexandria suddenly falling in, etc, etc. Again, the comic book obviously just plays out much differently because we don't have any time skips whatsoever. But I think the TV show absolutely nailed that vibe of always having to look over your shoulder. Just like with the very idea of the whispers themselves, the threats are now hiding in plain sight. Just like we talked about with the satellite and wanting to have this quote-unquote always watching sense of impending doom, I think the Dante Sadiq storyline is the absolute shining example of that. Just having this wacky goofy doctor dude who turns out to be so so much more insidious and literally poisoning everyone in the community is absolutely horrifying. Which is made even more horrifying by the fact that Dante in the comic, who is the literal spitting image of Dante in the show, is one of Maggie's right-hand men. Like, this dude does seem very, very trustworthy, whether you're a comic reader or not. A while ago, I did a stream ranking all the antagonists in the show. And admittedly, I had forgotten just how spooky Dante is throughout. 
All things considered, he of course doesn't end up having a huge impact on the story, aside from Sadiq and Gabriel. But in terms of strengthening the backdrop for the Whisperers as a whole and how they are constantly all around us, I think Kang absolutely nailed it. And also, also, the direction for the third episode, with us having this whole cold open of hour one, and then hour six, and so on, while we just see the walkers keep on coming, and coming wave after wave, was an excellent way to slowly but surely lead us into the full-blown conflict to follow. So yeah, in terms of actually escalating us towards the war, a absolutely insurmountable improvement over All Out War in my opinion. The satellite is still dumb though. And the last thing we'll tackle today is the whole Carol Alpha conflict I briefly touched on before. The interesting thing with Alpha for me in the show is that she felt like the first major villain to also be a very, very personal villain. Even though we'd already had these extremely personal stakes, such as Michonne and the Governor, or even Maggie and Negan, both of them still felt like they are big bads that wouldn't come down to personal matters. Whereas with Alpha, even though I obviously knew of the source material, my immediate knee-jerk reaction was that Carol would be the one to kill her. Not through some large-scale conflict, but very, very personally. Which is, of course, technically what ends up happening. But okay, let's not jump ahead. With the whole silly, wacky, goofy satellite falling and the survivors going into Alpha's lands, we have yet another meeting between her and the survivors at the border. And again, this is entirely new for the show. And man, the simple scene of Michonne saying, we only cross into your land once, and then Alpha correcting her saying, no, it's been three times, is just so, so good. It's like the ultimate reverse Uno of, oh no, you think you're sneaky. No, you're not. We see everything. It's just so horrifying. It's so good. And then Alpha baiting Carol into lashing out and taking a shot. Perfection. With just how big of a deal the border was the first time, hearing Alpha casually say they're moving it and making it again should obviously send shivers down your spine. And then having the wild card that is Carol just makes things that much more tense. And all of that is made even greater by, big surprise, the Daryl Carol dynamic. We of course see him notice that she is taking the pills, which had already been a whole point of conversation before, with Michonne too suspecting that she is having some sort of side effects. So on top of all of the fundamental whisper horror, we also have a case of Carol being an unreliable narrator, which immediately makes you question every single scene we see on our side. That whisper she just saw, are they even real? Are they there? Is that like a Henry vision? Like what's going on? So when it comes to just continuously building on paranoia and just always having us question what is even real, I think the show went over and above with nailing the horror. Because like, the book of Sophia, Lizzie, Mika, Sam and Henry is just chef's kiss. So yeah, all of this is to say that we really didn't need that dumb satellite. Like yeah, realistically, 10 years into the apocalypse, if they are still unmanned, they would start falling down to the earth, but they would also explode. So how about we never do this again? It's dumb, it makes no sense, and it is completely detached from the rest of the story. Let's never do this again. And because we've got an absolute boatload of stuff to talk about with Negan and all the changes there, this is where we'll leave it for today. As you might be able to gather, season 10 is a bit all over the place for me. There are things that I absolutely adore, but there are also things that I feel like are very cheap, if that makes sense. And as the season goes on, things will of course get a tad more messy with the year that shall not be named, also having a major impact on everything to follow. Though that is better left for another day. So, I hope to see you back as we continue in our journey through Season 10 and talk about the much, much different storyline of the books and how instead of being peanut butter and jelly like Negan and Aaron, Negan was much more of a devil on Rick's shoulder and less so them being a very nice and tasty sandwich. That sounded very weird, but I'm leaving it in. And that's the video. Let me spoil the retrospective for you a little bit. The second part is mostly done already, and it barely covers the next episode and a couple of issues. So yeah, I truly have no idea how long season 10 will end up being, let alone season 11. But anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. Without you, there'll be a whole lot less of my rambling, so seriously, thank you, thank you. And in case you want even more of my rambling, there's a bunch of Walking Dead stuff on the second channel as well, so feel free to check that out. Link as always is in the description. 
Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching. I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.